Pick a beautiful day to be indoors. Uh, and boy, I feel like I'm in a kind of a, a, a beatnik cafe. Belly <laughs> um, up to the bar and we'll take care of it. I just want to cover the day. Uh, for those of you, how many by the way were at the uh, field, uh, off the field day last uh, last week? Okay, put your hands down and go to sleep. Basically, I'm covering a lot of the same information, but this time I do have a connection. So uh, we're going to do a little bit of. Uh, of uh, interactive kind of things. Everybody see that okay? I don't have any real slides that have a lot of contrast, or need a lot of additional contrast. Um, let's look, look the other way. Yeah, that's good for me here, and you guys still have light. Perfect. Is okay. That good? Is that enough? No, that's fine for me. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Uh, and it should be enough back there, and it's enough to not trip over my cables. So what I want to cover real quick today uh, is just kind of why are we having some of these new tools, not just in alfalfa, but a lot of other cropping systems. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that technology we have out there with cell phones, 4G networks, uh, the cloud-based systems we have where you can see things, report them in the field, and, uh, and, and, and collect data. Um, so we can talk about, we're well, just going to briefly talk about scouting and reporting that uh, comes out. Uh, that are, that's available, some of those kind of products. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on our decision support, and then I want to introduce you to the uh, community-based data sharing that uh, a project that is uh, uh, available if you're interested. So I'm not going to spend much time on the scouting apps. Anybody who's using scouting apps knows these far better than I do. An example of one, you know, uh, scouting apps plus uh, a label, uh, a recommendation kind of writing. Uh, Agrium. I know there are a lot of commercial apps, public and in-house, so that a lot of the larger companies now, with their PCAs, are recording your data right in the field, getting GPS locations. Uh, that information is being sent back to the uh, to the uh, office. If it's uh, a lot of more seamless, so if a recommendation is being made, the orders are being placed, the orders of the papers being sent to the ag commissioner. Uh, all this stuff is going really, really quite seamless uh, with, with with this new technology. And then a lot of the follow-up paperwork is generated. But there are just standalone where you have these scouting apps that allow you to, particularly with traps in the orchards, there's a lot of apps out there now that allow you to put the location of the trap and the traps in and go out and get temperature data for you and that kind of thing. I'm not going to talk about that at all beyond what I just did, but just to say that there are those kinds of individual sorts of programs. What I want to spend a bit of time is talking about decision support tools, and I presented this to you. Uh, over the last couple of meetings we've had together because I think this is a really key issue for what we're doing in sustainable farming as well as meeting a lot of the uh, regulatory uh, requirements that we have. And I want to talk about the, uh, the prototype app for the four crops that we developed and about the, uh, just off of itself. And it's built off this report uh, contract and paper, uh, uh, white paper we did for DPR last year, it finished up just a couple of days ago officially, and it was looking at the critical use of papyrophos, Lorsban uh, and, and other, and other uh, generic na uh, names, that, um, that was asking the question, what is the critical use in alfalfa of, uh, for, for Lorsban? And uh, <laughs> some of you were on that crop team, and basically uh, the report was put together that uh, said we do have, there's a lot of pests that we aren't necessarily critical, but still important. And the critical ones for alfalfa that we'll be talking about was weevils and um, aphids. And I'm going to spend some time with blue alfalfa, aphid, a little bit, weevils, and some summer worms. There's a lot of lowers band used in summer worms. And in fact, I, I meant to slip that in there, I did not apologize. If you look at the use, the uh, use of Lord's band in alfalfa over 10 years, uh, you'll see that there's a peak in the spring and a peak in the summer. Almost, not quite, but almost, it's about a 60-40 breakdown with 40% of the use in summer. And that's primarily going to be either maybe some cowpea aphid, but primarily summer worms. And with summer worms, we do have good alternatives for them. We'll talk a little bit about that. And the point of this whole thing is, we made the case for DPR that Lord's Band is an important tool to keep in the toolbox to be used when we need it. And when we need it was early season aphids and to some extent um, uh, weevils. So 
If we could show the overall reduce use of Laura's band, showing a good faith effort to try and reduce it only where we need it, and not use it in the summertime where we do have some good replacements, then I think we've done a good job in, in letting them and the public know that we are being good stewards of it. So the decision support basically grows off of that, that report, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's really useful as a planning tool and can be used to go through real-time consideration of all, our, all alternatives and mitigation measures. If you're UPCAs in the room, you recognize that as the statement that's on your recommendation every time you sign a recommendation, give a recommendation. And uh, this particular, th this particular uh, tool, I think, helps you meet that, uh, meet that requirement. The benefits, it provides a logical framework for decision making, provides a framework for planning, it provides multi-pest information, and it provides really easy access to the information-rich pest management guidelines of UCIPM. This is what it's built upon is our pest management guidelines. And it provides a summary of all options. Many of you will, you know, are familiar with the UCIPM um, guidelines online, and um, the good news about this system is it's a really, seriously, the best in the world. It's a really information-rich system. You can keep drilling down further and further into it. The downside is um, it's a very, very information-rich system, and nobody really wants to spend time drilling down into it. So we've set these things up over the years, and this is the official uh, guideline from the University of California. We're responsible for maintaining them, revising them, and updating them. And we've done that for a number of years. Initially, they were printed, and they were printed in this kind of a format. But by the way, every one of these headers is exactly what you see on the website. So what we really have on the website is a document-based database. It's just took that document, we put it into a internet hyperlinked kind of a, approach. <clears throat> what we really need is to be able to go through and parse that data out and get it into buckets and go to it when, just when we need it and, uh, and present it just when you need it. So that's what we did with this project. So, many times when you come to a meeting, they'll tell you, put, put your cell phones down, blah, blah, blah. It's, I'm gonna ask you, to, if you got a smart device, you wanna take it out, you wanna follow along, please feel free. You can start, as I'm going to do, very, very dangerously. So what do we have here? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is see if I can get this on the screen. Well, it probably will, it's not a problem. So I'm gonna go right into Google and search it out. And I suggest you just put uh, uh, IPM decision tool and um, Davis, because that should connect us back into Davis. It didn't come up quite the way I wanted it to, like it usually does, because maybe we haven't used it as much. But let's just go to our homepage in the, are we getting the homepage back there? Good. So let's just go to the Davis homepage, let's go to Alpha. Let's make it work. Somebody doesn't want to connect in. As usual, here we go. Let's go to crops. They say you never, uh, what was it, W.C. Fields said you never act with children and dogs. And uh, you, you, you never go live on these things because it, it, uh, for some reason they decide that they don't want to work. Um, but it should be working, I don't understand why. What's that? Anybody got any suggestions, I'll take them. I'm not quite sure why that's not, uh, why that's not connecting when we have. It seems like you have a connection. Yeah, I got a connection. After I Google, I just went down about three or four, and it was right there. Is it? Well, what I'm getting is I can't even get, uh, I, I can't even seem to get um, this thing to respond to my clip. That's that's what I'm having a problem with. 
I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but if you just if you bear with me for just So that's what I'm looking for is right there, just going decision support IPM Davis, and it comes up. Okay, thank you. So this is your, I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, this little program consists of three screens. So the first one we're gonna look for is the crop. There's alfalfa, and it comes up with a set, this is a subset of the pests. These are the ones that Clopire Fosbors Man were used to run, but these are the key pests. So it comes up with, with the key pests there that you might want to be looking at. I'm going to be working, and by the way, if you didn't pick something up, if you didn't pick this up, this will be the end product that's coming out. And if you don't have one, please, if you, if you don't happen to have a phone with you or it's not working, uh, you can follow along with that. That will be the end product. We're going to talk about alfalfa caterpillar, we're going to talk about alfalfa weevil, and we're going to talk about blue alfalfa aphid. Now what you see is every time you do that, you can get a quick, which just tells you how to sample that very, very briefly, or detail, which takes you deep into the into more details on that. You can, if you wanted to, you can enter in the number of worms or uh, that you might have, uh, but uh, we're not going to work with that today at all. All we're going to do is, uh, is is just kind of look at the big part. So the first thing you see is every one of those tests that you click on it, it brings up the identification. You can go for more information, so you can get identification, sampling, and risk assessment, or economic threshold. So right off the bat, you've got your identification done. This is the, so the basis of, of IPM, right? Okay, so those are the three you're going to look at. So it comes up with this next. This is the second screen. If you look at that screen, it gives you management options, including chemical control. And there's your three pests, caterpillar, weevil, and blue alfalfa aphid. One of the management options, and this is, you can't see it here, but it's a thumbs up or thumbs down, and every one of these has to be answered. These X's here simply means we're doing in season right now. So for example, right in the middle of the season, we can't choose a resistant variety. We have to do that pre-planting. So that's a whole other line of, uh, of, uh, of decisions that can be made. So management options, some conservation of natural enemies, you can do an early harvest, you can do a border cutting. Natural enemies, natural enemies, natural enemies all the way across. Early harvest works well for caterpillar, works well for weevil, not, not for a blue alfalfa aphid. If you want more information, that's a live link right there. You can go there, click on that, and it'll take you right into the pest management guidelines as to what we mean by conservation of natural enemies for alfalfa caterpillar, or early harvest, or border cut. What do we mean by a border cut? Well, we, we recommend it for this pest and that pest. You click right on that, and it'll tell you and give you the information you need. So you can either you know, print it out or just simply say, every time I bring this pest up, I can get to that piece of information because there's a link there. Under chemical control, you see these little water droplets. Those water droplets take you right to what's called the uh, water tox program we've had for the last 15 years. No one's ever really used it because they really didn't know it was there. This takes you directly there. It uses NRCS's um, uh, 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 pesticide screening tool to look at what is, the, what is the toxic, what is the environmental risk to surface waters with the list of products that are going to be come up under these different pests. So it quickly gives you an overview of leaching, solubility, that kind of thing. Uh, threat to fish, threat to humans. Um, so let me just, so the first thing you got to do is you got to go in and you got to, so you got to either say yay or nay on everything. You can't leave this page until you make a decision about whether you're going to consider using any of these tactics. So as soon as I hit, as soon as I hit chemicals, there's the list of chemicals. Okay. That's our list of guidelines. That is not every chemical out there. It's what comes from our guidelines. But what it shows you is this would be pest one, pest two, and pest three. And of course, that refers to caterpillar, weevil, and alpha alpha eight. What you see when there's a check is the university has guidelines on that compound for that pest. So you can see for the pyrophos, for example, there are two checks on it. We don't have a check for 
because we do not recommend or suggest using Lord's band or worms in the summer. It's perfectly legal to do, but if that was, you know, if you chose, for example, you decided you needed to do that, then that one product would then be recommended and efficacious against all that whole spectrum of pests. So what we've done is, rather than going to alfalfa weevil, looking at what the guidelines say, and then leaving and coming back and looking at alfalfa caterpillar, and then leaving and going back and looking at aphid, it is simply put together in one place. It shows you what mode of action you would use. So now you can quickly look through that list and say, oh, you know, there's an awful lot of one bees there, or nanophosphates. <clears throat> Wonderful insecticide resistance management tool. Just so you know what the mode of action is, what the different ones are. It tells you what's the selectivity. Is it narrow or is it broad? Is it targeted or is it broad spectrum? And then, I think very, very important, what is the impact on mites, general predators, and parasitoids? So three major groups of natural enemies. What is it? Is it a low impact or a high impact or a medium impact? That's all labeled all the way across there for you. What's the impact on honeybees? And what's the duration of the natural enemies? Is it a long residual product or is it a short product? So if there's one page before you even decide what to do, you can look over all of this and say, if I want to conserve natural enemies, I want to look for the L's. If I, wanted, if I have multiple pests, I might want to look for uh, a, a more broad spectrum. So I'm going to go through here and just select some things. I'm going to go, okay, yeah, I'm going to want a BT for my summer worm. And I'm going to, want, I'm going to pick at least one pyrethroid. There's another worm material, fairly selective. <clears throat> Put clopyrifos there just because. And I won't go with by dimethoate. Um, I'm not going to go with belief because it's got the 60-day pre-harvest interval. I'm not going to go with belt, sorry, because I'm not sure that's going to be available. And then I'll say, yeah, for Savanto and for the Weevil, I'll put in Stewart. Um, I'll put in another pyrethroid. No to melathion. No to methanol, lanate, intrepid's a good selective worm material. I'm not going to choose spinosa because it's only available as in trust, the organic formulation, and it's fairly expensive. And then I'm just going to go ahead and say, well, I'll say yes to Mustang. We'll put all three of them in. And then you go to next. Now, if you didn't fill out one of those bubbles, it'll tell you you need to go fill out those bubbles, and you'll see why in a minute. So you've got to complete that. If you chose something, you didn't choose something, for example, suppose they didn't say early harvest. They would have put a fact that if there's a Y look at it, it shows not to put early harvest. I'm not going to use that technique. And at least says you consider that. These are pre-season for the most part. So they weren't really included into the whole thing. So what you see is what you thought you saw before. Your three pests, more information if you need it. So for example, if you're meeting with your client, you say, well, what do you mean by conservation of natural enemies? You can just click on that and where you go. It has now narrowed the selection of options to these, exactly as, excuse me, exactly as you saw before. It's just now narrowed it down. And then as you go further down the page, it gives you all that other information. But identification, how to sample, what the economic thresholds are, etc. It also gives you this right here. You can click on this and go to a, a really nice one-page handout back to your client about mitigating pesticide hazards and precautions for using pesticides. Just a really nice little slip of paper you can hand out and say, so if we're going to do this, we've got to make sure we're going to mitigate these things. So there's your nice report. And you sit there and you look at it online, perhaps, with your client. Or you make a PDF version of it. You do make the PDF version of it. This thing won't work. Come on. Oh, it's loading. Okay. But we have the PDF. You've got the PDF. Thank you. My my lovely assistant has brought to your attention. I I, I kind of remember where you follow us in this area of the valley where you uh, have a tin can as a string. At times you're not worthy of picking it. There we go. So that's what you have in your hand. This is the exact same report you want to see on the Okay, now this is something you can print out and hand out to your client and say, this is all the three pests we discussed for the year. 
here's all of our options, and leave them on top of it. Or you save this PDF on your smart device, and every one of these links stays active. So you bring this back up a week later, click on those, you can say, now what do we mean by conservation of natural enemies for alpha weeks? And that information then is ready again to be discussed. You don't have to go back into the pest management guidelines, search around for where that information was. It was all there. And as you see from your handout, it's multiple pages with all this information on it. Hey, Pete, I've got a question. Sure. So when it gets at the, for instance, in the, on the paper showing your options for, uh, for different uh, insecticides, and you've got a scale on there for toxicity to honeybees. That's a relative scale, but if somebody wants more specific information about uh, about spray restrictions at, at certain crop stages, mm -hmm. um, they have to refer to the label, of course. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. have you ever considered integrating a, a label database into this decision support tool? My my associate has just given given me a segue, but uh, let me answer that question by showing you the bee protection tool. So, the question was, is that, uh, yeah, that in fact, if you noticed, it was a four category. And that's the old system. The new system's a three category. You know, what, red, green, yellow, red. And that's what, I, as I understand, is going to be put under the labels, is the bee protection information. Uh, and the labels are being done, like, redone right now, as I understand it. And so that information's already been gathered, and I'll, let me just show you that in a minute. But, but just simply to say, <clears throat> You know, you now have, quite honestly, if you sat down and did this report before, just about the time maybe the client, the grower, the farmer himself, was getting ready to go to the Ag Commission or to get their uh, 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 permit list, and, and you have that with you, or you have that done, then you've got for the year, basically a plan. Now, just because you have, for example, Laura's been on this list, as you do when you go to the Ag Commission. It doesn't necessarily mean you may use it. It's just you just want it there in the background. So if you do need it, you're going to use it. It's the same thing here. You're looking at this and you're saying, this doesn't mean I'm going to use any of this. It just means these are the options I have. And from there, I can begin to choose. Among this, for, among this group of pests, it may be that the cowpea aphid pops in. So you go back, pick cowpea aphid, and you go through it again. So let me. Let me, let me see, take this, there we go. And I'm going to, that. Yeah, this is good, this is good. Okay. So wherever you see this logo, decision support, in the pest management guidelines, that's the link to what you just saw. And it's in four crops, almonds, alfalfa, cotton, and citrus. <clears throat> Since Nick brought up honeybee protection, let me just show you, he said with great faith in the whole system. D, uh, that I can This is where I ran the problem last, well, last, last week, Nick. Okay, let me see here. I'm going to device this real quick. Project and I want to duplicate, not extend. except when application is made between sunset and midnight, followed by a pesticide label, following allowed by pesticide regulations, and three is no bee precaution. So it's basically those three categories. You can't apply it if it's flowering, you can apply it if the bees aren't active, or if there's no impact on bees, you can apply it anytime you want. 
So what you have here is all, all types of pesticides, there's insecticides, let's go by common name, I apologize if you can't see that, and you just simply pick one out, you go through and say you want to admire, and you add to the list, and then it pops up with the different kinds of admire, a bait and, a, and, a, and the uh, pro, and it comes up with categories, one, two, or three. Well, what's other interesting is that's something here called other effects on bees, and it leads you to any other combinations, particularly fungicides. When you put a fungicide with an insecticide for some of these products, it's more of a hazard than individual. And so this has already done that for you. So again, the bee precaution uh, tool should be available within the pest management guidelines when you saw that particular little logo there. But you can add as many, you can go by active ingredient or you can go by trade name. And um, I'm going to put a belief on there. Just, 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 you just keep adding to the list. And belief or cat or uh, uh, Harvey is basically a three. So if you wanted to know, you didn't have a label in front of you, this is the first place to look, and of course, then go back to the label. Okay, now I'm going to go back to my... <clears throat> Just one second here. back up and perfect let me go back to this one and we got back and I'm just about finished here I just want to point out one more thing so again what you're going to be looking for is that is that honeybee recession and my projector stops cupping and comes back together. Well, you see that logo in any of the best management guidelines, click on it and take your right to that honeybee. Or my guess is if you go honeybee protection uh, tool, IPM, Davis, you should find it as well. So I'm going to leave the decision tool and go to another project that we're working on that I want to make you aware of and have you uh, think about uh, uh, working with this if you like. Um, I'm working with, uh, with, with uh, a group called, uh, it's a national program called IPI, which stands for an Integrated Pest Information Platform for Extension and Evaluation. We're working with an alfalfa in cotton, and it's, uh, it's a program that we access to really high-level modelers and database people to help us uh, track particularly invasive species, but in our case, common, uh, uh, common pests. And so it does a number of things. You can track various crop pests, you can enhance communication. Uh, it, it, we've developed some risk models, and it provides a self-assessment tool as well as, well as other um, uh, assessment tools. So there's some real-time real -time pest management. Um, there's a, there's a current uh, uh, status of IPM I'll tell you about, a survey that I'd like to have you participate if you'd like to. There's a, uh, a self-evaluation so you can, you can assess your IPM practice based upon uh, what you're doing and, what you, and then looking at what you might want to do. So these are very similar to what Sure Harvest has been doing, what uh, Central Coast Vineyards have been doing. It's based on IPM elements which came out of the Midwest. Um, we'll talk about that maybe just for a second. And then, of course, it, it provides easy access to all the information about alfalfa, which basically we took all of our links from our system and put it onto their system. So, real-time pest management, you can record, record your scout data from the field. The data is but it's collated and summarized on a map, and, and the pest distribution across the state can be monitored. We worked with this a little last year, not this year, Carlos, and um, um, it's got some real, it's still a work in progress, we'll leave it at that. And uh, if you're interested, you ought to take a look at it. When you put your data in, it'll basically, it'll keep you anonymous and to 
that's a real problem with privacy. And so people say, if I put my data in, I don't want people to know that it was on the corner of Fourth and Elm Street. So what they've done is they take all the data and put it right in the center of the county, which doesn't do anybody any good because everybody knows we've got a blue alfalfa agent in the county. What we want to know is the North County or South County. So it's still a work in progress in that. The other thing they've done is to develop pest models for stem nematode to help predict when stem nematode, particularly in the Delta, is, uh, is going to be a particular problem. And they're working on one for blue alfalfa agent, which I think is going to be very valuable to us. But we need more data. So that bridges into this really interesting why would we want to put data in? Why would I want to take the time to actually put the fact that I find a blue alfalfa agent somewhere? Well, if you look at the distribution during the outbreak between 2013 and 2015, you know, it occurred south and went north, and it's still a major problem in the north, more than it is even in the south or the central part of the state. But if we had that information where PCAs in Bakersfield could be reporting that they're picking up blue alfalfa agent, it would have helped us be a lot more aware that it was coming north to us. And this area got hit pretty hard back in 2014. Um, and so to be able to say, if you could break it down even by township, but not even section, but township, and say, OK, somebody's picking it up there, somebody's picking it up here, so I better be, you know, it's coming my way and it's coming fast. I think this kind of communication, where people can share their data, and I get something from it because I'm going to be looking at your data as well, which is just spots on the map. It isn't anything about you know, the particular farmer or anything else. It's just spots on the map to help this kind of guide through this. So we've got it set up for all the major pests in alfalfa. You can record it. It could then, and nationally, this map would be available as well. So what we're trying to do is to say, if, you put, if you're going to be an observer, you're going to get a little bit more resolution. And if you're somebody who goes, I'm not going to put data in, but I want to see what all my colleagues are doing, you're going to get a much more general one. So what we're looking for, what they're looking for, are people who are willing to try this. And I think, kick myself because I thought I brought those along. But uh, um, talk to me if you want to, if, if you if you want to, to make contact because the people who actually handle this are in North Carolina, and you can find more about it if you just if you just uh, Google iPipe, and you'll find there's a whole bunch of different crops. I think we're going to have 30 crops by the end of this project. I thought it's just one in California. So if you if you want to be a, actually put data in, you've got to register with it. But I think if you want to do, for example, the survey or the self-assessment, you can just go on the website ed.education or ed.i. Um, so I want to take just a minute to let you know that we're going to be asking if you want to participate in a survey about your IPM methods and alfalfa. That survey is, is, is open and available. This really helps us figure out well, how much IPM is being used and where, where the bar might be. And so we're going to send a uh, request out for some of the local counties as well as um, uh, the uh, California Alfalfa Forage Association uh, to try and get people to, to respond to this. I would really like to see some response. They say it takes about 20 minutes. It isn't my survey. It's the, uh, it's, it's the uh, social scientist out of this project, which is in, uh, which is in North Carolina. Uh, because if I can get some of this information on some of the key questions they have, I'd like to present that as part of our alfalfa symposium in, in December, just to kind of see. And if you've not seen, we've done some really large surveys of IPM use in cotton and almonds, as well as some of the other crops. And it's really useful to see kind of what's being used, how much knowledge there sort of is, so that we can either step up the programs, go back and redo programs, put California in looking at other states. And I'll end on that one because I did meet with uh, the director of the Office of Pesticide Programs at EPA, and we met in alfalfa field back about a month and a half ago. And he was here with his staff specifically to say this chlorpyrifos thing, this Lord's band thing, you know, he was asking the same questions we asked. How critical is it? What happens if you lost it? Do you really need it? And so we sat out in that alfalfa field for about an hour discussing it. Uh, Brian Lee, by the way, with CDPR was there. Uh, the local ag commissioner from Tulare was there. And they already had our reports. So they had most of the information. And they just wanted to get from the field, from the PCAs and the farmers, you know, what would happen, you know, why, why is this so important? And one of the things that kept coming up and up and up is that why, and, and Brian, and your director of the Department of Pesticide Regulation was right next to me saying the same thing. We are light years ahead 
of where a lot of states are. Why did this whole papyrus floss thing come up in the first place? Because somebody put so much on it, it literally, it literally got in the water system. I mean, it, it, so the problem was they don't have a tolerance level <laughs> for Lohr's van in water. They got it in food, but not in water. So I just kept, I just asked her, so that sounds like a pretty specific, they never told me where or who or what state. So it sounds pretty specific. It goes, yeah. I said, well, then why don't you take it away from that? Why are we being punished? And, and, and I went back and explained these programs I just discussed with. I explained that we have PCA, so we're highly qualified people who are making these recommendations. We got growers that are already heavily regulated who are aware of these things. I said, we're already ahead of the curve in terms of protection. Why can't we get some dispensation for that? Uh, never gave me an answer, and basically I know what the answer was. Um, you know, most of us deal with one bad apple, and that's how we get regulated. But, but, uh, but we really made the case that California really is different. We really do take this seriously, and we've got tools to help in this way. And I hope he went away with a little bit of, because he not only talked to Alfalfa, but he went through all the major commodities for a full day. He was out there with all the major commodity groups, PCAs, commodity board members, et cetera. So this kind of information, if you, if you would take the survey, would really help, uh, would help kind of set that uh, somewhat in the stone. So on that, I'm going to stop, because I probably took way too much time. I'm sorry.